<clears throat> Matthew chapter 27, beginning with verse 32. Matthew 27 and verse 32. Praise the Lord. Amen. Going to be looking at the crucifixion of Jesus this morning. Really, when you think about it, it's unbelievable. It's believable, but it's unbelievable in a sense what he went through. Beyond comprehension. Amen. But he is alive this morning. He made it through his Calvary. Verse 32. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when, were they, when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews." Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. Now, the other text of gospel says two malefactors as well. So you have two thieves and two malefactors that are crucified with him. They are not the same. But verse 38 again, then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and, and elders said, He saved others himself, he cannot save, if he be the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me some of them that stood there when they heard that said this man calleth for Elijah and straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put a reed it on a reed and gave him to drink the rest said let be let us see whether Elijah will come to save him Jesus when he had cried again with a loud voice yielded up the ghost and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. <clears throat> and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went to the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earth quake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. God, we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise and the worship for it. Ask you to speak in and through us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> the crucifixion of Jesus. <clears throat> the scripture tells us that as Jesus was carrying his cross to Golgotha, 
there is a man <clears throat> their name is Simon of Cyrene. That's North Africa. <clears throat> and he's compelled to carry the cross of Jesus. Later, we find out in the Word of God, Mark 15, 21, that his sons, Alexander and Rufus, uh, came into the church, amen, and became believers as well. But this North American, uh, North African man uh, com was compelled to carry the cross of Jesus, and he did. The Bible says when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of the skull, <clears throat> they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. When he had tasted thereof, he would not drink, and they crucified him and parted his garments. <clears throat> so when we look at this, <clears throat> the crucifixion of Jesus, I will share with you briefly some information from a medical journal. It is the Journal of American Medical Association on the Physical Death of Jesus Christ and <clears throat> what he went through. Amen. <clears throat> They got him there to the place of crucifixion, Golgotha, which is the place of the skull. It's also called the place of bones and the place of death. Golgotha was Gehenna. It was located south of Jerusalem in the garbage dumps, Gehenna, which later became a type of hell. <clears throat> the traditional locations of Jesus' crucifixion today are not authentic, or they are not proven. Uh, that, that mountain they call Calvary, if you look at a picture, it looks like a skull. It is not proven that that's where he was crucified. I won't go into the history of all of that, but all of that land and territory that Jesus walked on was crucified, buried, rose again, amen, from the dead the third day, his birth. All of that was plowed under many, many times in history. So traditionally, there are things that are said to be the locations of Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, they're not proven. Gehenna was known as the place of the skull. It was known as the place of bones. It was known as the place of death. Uh, south of Jerusalem, the place is really is a type of hell. And so Jesus Christ would have been crucified there in Gehenna. Amen. A lot of people don't know that, but that's the historical record. When they got him to Golgotha, the place of the skull, the skull, what they would have done to him according to studies, and there's a man by the name of uh, Sir Cain. Uh, he wrote a book. He was of the University of London in 1937. He wrote a book uh, that talked about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ along with this medical journal that I've already referred to here. It talks about the medical aspects of his crucifixion. What they did was they gathered him there at Golgotha. And they offered him, the Bible says, a vinegar to drink, mingle with gall. It was some kind of painkiller. And Jesus rejected the painkiller because he's going to experience the full pain and suffering of what you and I would have gone through. At that point, then they would take him and they would, if it was Jesus or anybody else, they would take them and they would violently throw him to the ground. I mean violently throw him down. Then they would take and they would spread his arms out on the crossbar. And the crossbar was called the, the uh, uh, patabulum, the crossbar. Place his arms spread out on the patabulum. And then they would take these huge square nails and they would drive those nails through his wrist. You know, we have the, the idea that it went through here. But according to medical journals and according to Sir Cain, it actually went through the wrist. So it's a part of the hand. So these very large square nails, <clears throat> spikes if you will, were driven through the wrist of his hands. There he is with the outstretched arms of the uh, the uh, patabulum. And so then after they got him on that, they would raise both the patabulum and the crossbar with his body. And they would place it in a notch that was on what is called the stipes. And the stipes was the vertical pole that stood up out of the ground. So they raised that patabulum, that crossbar with him on that. And they put him in that notch and dropped him down there. Then... They would have, at that point, uh, there was what was called the sedalium, 
And it's also called the sedi, sedal, which is a small type. Um, it's a stake, basically. It shows here like a seat, but it's actually a stake. So they've got him up there, and then they would take this stake, the sedalium, and they would drive it through. They would turn his body about 90 degrees. And I'll see if I can show you a picture of that. You probably can't see this very well, but they would turn his body about 90 degrees in the opposite direction of the way his hands were facing. After they did that, then they would take the sedalium, the stake, and they would drive it through the fleshly part of the buttocks just underneath the hip bone so that there he would rest upon that sedalium uh, on the hip bone. So it would be a very painful thing. Amen. So he's got his hands out this way. His body's twisted 90 degrees. He's got the sedalium running through his fleshly part of his buttocks all the way. They literally drove it through his body. And it was a very cruel and crude seat that he would sit on. After that, they would take nails and they would place his feet one on top of the other. And they would drive those nails through the top of his feet. When they did that, all the organs uh, that we have in our bodies, the internal organs that we have in our body, all of the nerves that you have connected to those organs in your body uh, end in the feet. So that when they would have driven those nails through his feet, they would have severed all of those nerves. They would have separated those nerves of all of those organs that those nerve endings go to in the feet. And so that Jesus Christ, as he's hanging on the cross, would have literally felt all the diseases, all the malfunctions of all the organs of the body at one time. That means he felt what it was like to have lung cancer in a moment's time. He felt what we'd be, we'd be like to have brain cancer in a moment of time. He felt what it would be like to have diabetes in a moment of time. He felt what it would be like to have a migraine headache in a moment of time. He felt what it would be like to have lung cancer in a moment of time. Any malfunction that a human being could possibly go through in its body, all the pain, the disease, everything, all the symptoms that a person could ever experience in their body physically by way of disease or malfunction was instantly, as soon as they severed those nerves in his feet, instantly throughout his body, he experienced every one of those in an instant of time. So there he is. He's hanging on that cross, his hands out, stretched, his body twisted 90 degrees, the sedulum, sedulum is run through his fleshy part of his buttocks. He's resting upon his hip. He's got the nail driven through his feet, severing and separating all of those nerve endings of all the organs of the body, instantly going through the pain and the agony of every possible disease and malfunction that a person could go through. As he's on that cross, hanging there on the cross, he would no doubt, lowering himself just a little bit. And when he did, he could inhale. He could breathe. But he could not exhale without pushing himself up upon the cross. So he would drop down and the, the nails in his wrist or his hands as he would drop down, it would shoot pain all through his body and explode in his brain in a moment of time. He would get cramps in his muscles. The pectoral muscles in his arms would give way to cramping. And all through his body, cramps, raging cramps and pain would begin to move through his body and explode in his brain in just a moment of time as he pulled himself to exhale. So he's basically suffocating as well. He pulls himself up on the cross. He exhales he drops back down. When he does, the pain begins to shoot through his arms again. He pushes himself back up, and when he does, the nails in his feet 
send the pain through his feet. And slowly by slowly, as he seeks to do this for six hours, from nine in the morning to three o'clock in the afternoon, he is going through that. As he is doing that, slowly, over a period of time, serum begins to accumulate in the cavity, the chest cavity of his body. And it would begin to compress the heart. The heart would be forcing blood into the mangled tissue of his body. And so this very thick blood, if you will, being forced into the fleshly parts of his body, mangled parts of his body, his heart would begin to, along with his lungs, begin to fail because of the inability to breathe very well. His heart would be compressed by the serum. The fluids in his body, the fleshly fluids of his body would begin to dissipate. And as a result of that, it would be very hard for the heart to pump that blood through the mangled flesh of his body. Until finally, as he's hanging on the cross, and remember the first thing he said was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But as he hangs on upon the cross, he cries out as Matthew said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He gets close to death. One of the sayings he says, he says, it's, it's finished. And then he says, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he died. They went to him and they broke his legs to make sure that he would, if he wasn't dead, that he would uh, be dead by asphyxiation. And then after that, they took a sword or a spear and they pierced his side. And all of that fluid, all of that water, all of that serum, and, and, and then the breaking of his heart, the bursting of his heart, he literally broke, his heart was broken. It burst there upon the cross and then all of a sudden, all this water and this blood begins to flow out of his side as he died on Calvary's cross at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. As you study the medical reports of Jesus' death on the cross, it brings home to us the excruciating pain and suffering and agony that he went through us uh, for us. There is no other way of death that is more cruel and more painful than crucifixion and he went through all of that for us he did that for you and he did that for me amen, amen. the bible says as he dies upon the cross they're also in shame naked they've stripped his clothes off of his body i do not believe there was a loin of cloth around him there he is hung in shame upon the cross the location of his crucifixion, Gehenna, would have been a place where wild animals would have gathered and slowly eaten his flesh off of his body. The birds would have flown from the air, and while he was alive, they would have plucked his eyes out of his skull. In fact, that's the way a lot of the people that were crucified died, was they died by wild animals literally reaching up and, and devouring the flesh while they were still alive. And the birds would pluck the eyes out of their skull while they were still alive. But Jesus was not allowed to, to stay upon the cross that way. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells us they hung over his head the accusation, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. In verse 36, the Bible says, and many of them that were there sat down and watched him there. There's two types of people. There are those that sit at the foot of the cross and they contemplate and they think about what does it mean? What has Jesus done? What is this about? Why is this man dying like this? And then there are others, the Bible says in verse 39, that just walk, walk by. They pass by and they reviled him and they wag their he heads. As Lamentations 1 and verse 12 says, Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? You have two kinds of people today as we speak about the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus. Those that contemplate, that meditate, that think about what he did for us and what it means. And then you've got those that have no time for him. Who walk by and they pass by and they wag their heads. 
as Lamentation says, as those that pass by, is it nothing to you? I want to be the kind of person that they, they not only just contemplates and meditates upon what Jesus did, but I want to give my life to him. Amen. Amen. And I want to live for him. I want to be the one, I want to be blessed and, and be the one that puts my faith in him. Amen. Amen. When I think about it, my condition before him is clearly seen. Sin is clearly seen. The wrath of God Almighty upon sin upon his own son. Sin is such a horrible thing that God can't even bear to look upon it. The Bible says that the heavens are not even clean in his sight. The scripture talks about the seraphim hide their face. Abraham said, I am but dust and ashes. Job said, I abhor myself in sackcloth and ashes. Isaiah said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Daniel had no strength in his body. We all need a Savior today. And Jesus is that Savior. And Jesus went through all of this just for you. He went all the way. Went all the way. T.W. Barnes, many, many years ago, I told you about him. He's a prophet of the Lord. He went through a time of discouragement. He felt like giving up. The enemy was coming against him, attacking him. There were all kinds of things that he was facing in his life at that time. And I'm talking about a seasoned minister of God. I'm not talking about a new convert. He became very discouraged. And as he was in that time of discouragement, God showed him a vision of Jesus carrying his cross up to Golgotha or Calvary. And when Tom Barnes saw that, he said, he went all the way for me. How can I do less? And I'll never forget, and I heard that message, when a person in the congregation shouted out, he went all the way for us. Amen. And I really don't want to just talk, I don't really don't want to just put it in a context of discouragement. But I can tell you this, brothers and sisters, he went all the way for us. And went through more than you and I can even begin to imagine. There are some who take time to sit down and look at it and meditate upon it. And allow, it allows it to affect their lives. There are those that pass by and wag their head. It's nothing to them. They don't have time for the Christ of God. But the Bible says... That while he's there hanging on the cross that we have, they're saying they're mocking him. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. If he does, he can't save us. The chief priests are mocking him with the scribes and elders, religious leaders. He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. See, he has been mocked. Not just by men, but he's being mocked by hell. He is ex lex. In the eyes of God. He is ex lex in the eyes of men. Not just exilic, but ex lex. Which means seen as an outlaw. By men and by God himself. Rejected of men and rejected of God. Hung between heaven and earth. Heaven would not receive him at that time. And the earth did not want him. But there he hung between heaven and earth. The redeemer of mankind. Being mocked by people there at the cross and by hell. But the Bible tells us in verse 40. Amen. That. They said, he, he said, you destroy the temple in three days and I'll raise it up. See, they're mocking him, what he said. Twisting 
what he said. Amen. The thieves also which were crucified him cast the same in his teeth. We know the male factor, one male factor believed. And Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Not only the fact that he was saved that day is a miracle, but the fact that he was able to die that day. Because normally it would take up to 21 days for a person to die. So when Jesus looked at the male factor and said, this day you'll be with me in paradise, not only is a miracle of salvation, but a miracle that he died. Was it just thieves there that day that hung next to Jesus? Men who had robbed the treasuries of the Roman Empire? But it was male factors. A male factor was a male homosexual. That in the act of homosexuality, his Roman superior died. So they took the male factors, the homosexual man, men, two men, nailed them to crosses as well, or placed them on crosses as well. Because in the homosexual act, the superior Roman authority had died. So these are the kind of people that are around Jesus that day in his death. Thieves and malefactors, robbers and homosexuals. But the malefactor put his confidence in the Lord. And Jesus saved that malefactor. It shows you the power of, of the gospel, it shows you the power of his ability to save mankind. That if a thief would turn to him, he could save him. If a a homosexual would turn to him. God could save him. Amen. Amen. Because God is able. Amen. I talked to a man just the other day in passing. He's a man that's got a well-known ministry here in Odessa, Texas. Jail ministry. And I will not give you his name. But I'm sure many of you have heard of him. And But he and I were just in a conversation yesterday. And. He made mention to me about different things that people go through, whether it be addictions in their bodies, addictions. And because he works with that kind of ministry, he talked to me about those addictions. He said, if a person who's addicted to drugs can make it through uh, the time where their body, you know, he says it's about the body. He says, if a person can make it through that time when the body is, is uh, going through, uh, you know, withdrawals that they can normally make it in the kingdom of God. If they could just make it through that time where the body is going through withdrawals. But he said homosexuality is one of the strongest things that can get a hold of a person's life. Because it's body, soul, and spirit. This is a very challenging thing for a, a person to be saved from homosexuality, whether it be male or female. But that day we have an example of a male factor, a, a male prostitute, homosexual prostitute that was saved by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The power of salvation. The power of God to save us. Even in my life, where I am now, in prayer, oftentimes I say, Lord, the power of your salvation. I need the power of your salvation to save me. The power, the, the efficacy. Amen. The blood that was shed on Calvary's cross that day has never lost its power. There's a term that's used. It's efficacious. That means it's just as effective today as it was approximately 2,000 years ago. The power of the saving blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of the God-man. Pure, undefiled blood that was shed that day. That flowed out of his body. Is efficacious. It's still effective today. It has not lost its power. And I often go to him in my humanity as many of those men I've already talked to you about this morning, like Job and Isaiah and Abraham, etc., 
And I talk to God about the power that I need from him to save me. If he can save a male factor, he can save me. If he can save me, he can save a male factor. Because the blood has never lost its power. Men, we may look at ourselves and say, I'm but dust and ashes. We may be like Isaiah say, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. We may be like Daniel and say, there's no strength left in me. We may be like the seraphim that want to veil our faces in the presence of a holy God. But the power of his salvation. I rely upon him to save me as you do. Amen. So verse 44, the thieves, the Bible said, that were with him cast the same in his teeth. The mockery. Amen. From the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Just about at the time of his death, when he cries out, Eli, 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 lemma sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As he gives up the ghost, lifts up his head in victory, and Tetelestai says, it is finished. The Bible says at that moment, the sixth hour, that's three o'clock in the afternoon. No, six hour, excuse me, before he dies. He's crucified nine o'clock in the morning, the sixth hour of the day, 12 o'clock, mid, midday, 12 o'clock, before he dies at three. From the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. From 12 o'clock to three o'clock in the afternoon. In the middle time of the day, midday, if you will, the sun went out. It was not an eclipse. According to astrologers, the sun was the furthest it could possibly be from the moon at that time. It was not an eclipse. It was the light of the world, God. Amen. Amen. Withdrawing himself as he sees his son dying on the cross. It's a supernatural darkening of the sun. They would have put it together. They would have understood that the darkening of the sun speaks of judgment. Supernatural darkening of the sun. We see here that the judgments of God are falling upon him. We see the bowls of wrath of the book of Revelation. The judgments of the future are falling upon him. We see the plagues in the Old Testament in, in Egypt that fell upon Egypt are falling upon him. The pains of hell that the sinner will experience eternally. Is being demonstrated upon him as he hangs upon the cross. So from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, darkness filled the earth. The wrath of a sin-hating God has fallen upon him. Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He felt what the sinner is going to feel throughout eternity without God. Cursed of men and cursed of God. Exlex, an outlaw. Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elijah. Because they believed and some believed that Jesus was a rabbi. They believed that when a rabbi was being tortured like this, all he had to do was call upon Elijah and Elijah would come and help him. But there is no help from Elijah. 
Straightway, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. The veil of the temple, the veil that barred man out of the presence of God, is now from the top to the bottom. It's been rent, not from the bottom to the top, not by the hands of men, but by the hands of God. That veil that was about the thickness of a hand's breadth. God's power ripped it from the top to the bottom, giving access to the presence of God for man. A way was opened up into the presence of God. In Psalm 85 verse 10, the Bible says this. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. That day when the veil was rent from the top to the bottom, God, God tore that veil that barred man out of the presence of a holy God. The judgment seat that was behind that veil has now become a mercy seat. The tables of the law that were in that Ark of the Covenant that spoke of the judgments of God upon man's sin. That judgment, that law came running out that morning or that afternoon. The mercy of God by the blood came running out together and met Jesus at the cross. The condemnation of the law met Jesus on the cross, the mercy of God, and they kissed there at Calvary. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. In that instant, in that moment of time. It is the place, as I have told you before, where east meets west. The Bible tells us in Psalm 103, verse 12, another beautiful psalm. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sin from us. Verse 12, Psalm 103, as far as, far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. Depending on your perspective, from God's perspective, the temple faces toward the east, the east, the tabernacle face toward the east. Amen. As man approached the presence of God, he was facing west. From God's perspective, he's facing east toward the sun rising. Salvation is found in God. From man's perspective, he's coming from the east and he's facing to the west. So literally, the presence of God that faces east toward the sun rising and the face of man coming and approaching God for salvation, facing a western direction, which speaks of his lost condition. As he comes facing west and the presence of God facing east, it is where east, God, meets west, man's lost condition. Depends on your perspective. You listen to a message I preached not long ago, a few years ago, where east meets west. Amen. West speaks of man's lost condition in that context. 
coming to God, the east. But also, east speaks of God. So, if you're moving from the east, you're moving away from God. If you're moving westward, you are moving into sin, lostness. But from the perspective, as I preach to you, you need to listen to both the message. I don't have time this morning. From Ezekiel's temple, the altar, the steps facing east, or man coming from the west as he approaches God, it's a different perspective. It's man's back on the eastern direction of false religion. But it's also his western condition as he comes to God in salvation. So it depends on the perspective you preach it from as to what the directions mean. If you, pre, if you listen to where east meets west, you will understand what I'm talking about. If you listen to the message on Ezekiel, you'll understand. There's two different perspectives that are given there. But the whole point is this. Is that when a man approaches God who's facing toward the east, the sun rising. And he's facing toward the west. It's where east God meets west. The Westness of man. Amen. 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 But when you look at it very carefully in the Word of God, you look at the directions in the Bible, you have north, you have south, you have east, you have west. But in the Hebrew's mind, north and south is really not a big deal, it's east and west. Amen. When we talk about as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, we need to understand what God is saying here. He's removed that sin as far as the east is from the west. That means this, if you start traveling east, if you look at a globe, and you're traveling east, amen, around that globe, you travel east, there's no such thing as an east pole. If you travel west, there's no such thing as a west pole. There's no destiny. So when you travel east, around the globe, it never turns into west. If you travel west, there's never a time it ever turns into east. So what God is saying is infinite. It's an infinite line. Man. He's saying that he has removed it eternally. If you talk about north and south, there's a North Pole destiny. There's a South Pole destiny. So when you travel to the North Pole, when you hit that pole, at some point you can start traveling south. If you go to the South Pole, you hit that destiny, at some point it turns into north. So there, it's not infinite, Amen. the north and the south. Amen. But when you talk about directions infinitely, the east and the west speaks of eternity. East never turns into west, and west never turns into east. But I want you to think about this. It's the only time in history where east met west. Where God's saving power met man in his western condition at the cross. It's also the only time in history where two infinite lines met. East is an infinite line. It never turns into west. And west is an infinite line. It never turns into eastern direction. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. But there's a vertical line that's also infinite. Amen. If I stand here today, and I'm not talking about north or south, this way. But if I draw a line... And I intersect where east meets west, the infinite line of where east meets west. And I stand here and I draw a line straight up. Amen. Then that line keeps going up and up and up and it goes through the clouds and it goes all the way through the heavens and it never stops. Amen. It's infinite. Amen. 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 If you go down, straight down, 
That line is an infinite line. So the point is you have two infinite lines. When you stand here and you go up an infinite line, it never stops. It's eternal. You have where east meets west. It's an infinite line. East never becomes west. Never be west never becomes east. But when those two lines, two infinite lines intersect, you have a cross. And it's the first time in the history of man where two infinite, two eternal points met. And that was at Calvary's cross. It's the first time where east, which is an infinite line, met west. They intersected there at the cross. It's the first time that east, at that point of Calvary, at that point right there, is the first time they met. See, Jesus had to be at that very place, at that very moment, at that very time. He couldn't have been this far over. He couldn't have been this far over. He couldn't have been here. He could not have been there. He had to be exactly in that place at that moment of time in history for two infinite lines, east and west and up and down, to meet where east met west, where the saving power of God, which faces to the east, met the lost condition of man in the west. And only God could do that. And so that's why he said, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sin from us. Because east met west at Calvary. And he removed our sin, not just for time, but he knew, removed it infinitely, forever and ever and ever eternally. Amen. So the veil of the temple was rent that day. Making way for man to enter into the presence of God. Where mercy and truth are met and righteousness and peace have kissed. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, shielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Not only was it dark that day, but there was a mighty earthquake that shook the earth. Historians that lived during that time said that earthquake was felt all over the world. It wasn't just felt in Israel, Jerusalem that day. It was felt all over the world. They said they felt it in Russia what is today known as Russia. They felt it in China. They felt it in Africa. That earthquake, what he did, the significance of that, shook the whole world. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. The earth did quake and the rocks were rent. The graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. First fruits. And came out of the graves after his resurrection. Went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Can you think about that? All of these things that are happening. The voices that are there. The darkness that's there. The earthquakes that there. The voice of God. Jesus hanging on the cross. Seven saints from the cross. All of these things. Can you imagine the impact that it would have? Now you have people who have died or in their sepulchres. The first fruits of them. Many of them. Not all of them. But many of them that slept arose when he died. And appeared in the holy city after the resurrection. Can you imagine that? You're in your house. The time of his crucifixion. The graves open. The time of his resurrection, many Old Testament saints that were dead begin to walk through the holy city of Jerusalem. And maybe they would go to your house. And when they talk about how Jesus had risen from the dead. Miracles around this event. The centurion 
and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the son of God. Love spared not his only son. People at the great white throne judgment someday will see the one who died for them. The love of God expressed upon Calvary's cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And many women were there beholding afar off which followed Jesus from Galilee ministering unto him among which was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's children. A profound impression that day. When his side was pierced, outflowed blood and water that day, he gave birth to a bride. There's three ways to get into a family, brothers and sisters. One is by adoption, one is by marriage, and then one is by birth. And he made a way to take care of all three. Amen. Let's stand. Father God, we stand in your presence today in humble awe and reverence. We thank you, Lord, for the unspeakable gift of eternal life. Help us, Lord, as we look at this, as we sat at the foot of your cross today and contemplate its meaning. And put within us a thankful heart this morning, God, for everything that you went through for us. If we ever doubt your love, Lord, let us... You see your arms outstretched upon the patibulum, embracing the world, seeking to save a lost and dying world. There are some, God, today who would doubt your existence. There was some today that would doubt that you're the creator of the heavens and the earth. And there are some that would doubt that you love man. But Lord, we see at Calvary, the eternal creator of the heavens and the earth, robed in humanity, dying a cruel death to save us from hell, which we all deserve because we are sinners. Lord, let us never forget where you found us and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, we stand in your presence today where east meets west. Where God meets man in his lost condition. And man facing toward his God in need of salvation. Thank you today, Father. As we look at the cross, we see your mercy and your grace displayed. And you pardon us like a governor would pardon a prisoner. And let us also remember God. That you're a consuming fire. When we see you hang upon the cross. We see the way you feel towards sin. The wrath of a living God. Upon his hatred for sin. But the love of God displayed. you gave your only son so Lord we ask you God today we will not waste your blood 
We ask you to cleanse us with that precious blood. Forgive us of every evil thought, every evil word, and every evil action. Purify our hearts and minds today with your blood. Save us, Lord, by your power. The power of the living God. And we give you all praise and all glory and all honor for it. As we look at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for being in the house of God this morning.